Hello everyone, today we're going to discuss the pelvis and the upper femora. And in particular, we're going to discuss the general procedural guidelines for these parts. As far as the general procedural guidelines, we'll talk about patient preparation, general patient position, the IR collimated field size, the SID that's used, ID markers, radiation protection, and patient instructions. As far as patient preparation is concerned, whenever you're doing a hip or a pelvis, you want to remove um, any artifacts from the anatomy of interest. This would include um, any undergarments that may have elastic in it that may cast a shadow, uh, clothing, and then provide the patient with a hospital gown. General patient position, ambulatory patients are supine on the x-ray table, whereas non-ambulatory patients who uh, use proper transfer techniques to put them on the table. Uh, if it's not possible, you can always use a grid IR placed directly underneath uh, the patient. The textbook gives you guidelines as far as the IR and collimated field size. Uh, grid IR needed for examinations taken with a patient in the bed or on a stretcher. So because you're going through a thicker part, hip or pelvis, lots of scatter radiation is being generated via Compton effect, and you're going to then have to get rid of that, so you're going to have to use a grid to capture that scatter before it hits the image receptor. SID used for hip and pelvis is 40 inches as the standardized SID. ID markers, of course, we want to use our lead, right, or left markers. markers. Uh, other ID markers must be in the blocker elsewhere on the final image. And once again, you know, it is not recommended that you use digital annotation to uh, place the side markers on the image. We should be using our lead markers for this purpose. As far as radiation protection is concerned, uh, we should be able to shield mailed patients. Uh, there are guidelines in your book on page 33 and 34 uh, of volume one. It's difficult to shield patients uh, for uh, a hip, a female patient for a hip. Uh, you can put the uh, lead apron on an angle and at least cover one over usually. Uh, for males, uh, you should be able to shield both for hip and for pelvis. The testes lie at a level lower than the symphysis pubis, so you should be able to shield and, and you should shield whenever possible. Other radiation protection measures would include close collimation and using, of course, the optimum technique factors. Patient instructions, you want to make sure that they understand breathing instructions. For the hip and the pelvis, respiration is suspended. Uh, for the exposure, usually on expiration. Essential projections for the pelvis and upper femora, the femoral necks, hip, and the acetabulum will be talked about now. So for your AP pelvis and upper femora, uh, the pelvis patient is supine. Uh, the median sagittal plane of the body is centered to the midline of the uh, table. Uh, equal ASIS to table distance on both sides, which means that your patient isn't rotated to the right or the left. Sometimes uh, we do have to put a small sponge under the patient's pelvis to raise one side or the other, making sure that that ASIS to tabletop distance is the same on both sides. Very importantly, we want to medially rotate the feet and lower limbs to 15 to 20 degrees. So we're inverting the toes, basically, the feet 15 to 20 degrees. What that does is allows the femoral necks, which normally are at an angle, when we invert the feet, we take the femoral necks and we put them parallel to the IR. Uh, when we do that, it's going to, of course, avoid foreshortening. Uh, if there is trauma involved, a suspected broken hip, we don't want to do any rotation of the limb. Uh, we don't want to injure the patient anymore. The upper border of your IR should be about one to one and a half inches above the crest. Now that's providing your collimating correctly to a 14 by 17. Your central ray is uh, perpendicular. 
and you're going to go generally about two inches above the uh, symphysis pubis uh, with that uh, central ray. If we take a look at the radiograph here, uh, we can see identification-wise, we've got the iliac crest, we've got the ala or wing of the ilium, ASIS, the SI joint, the AIIS, the femoral head, the greater trochanter, the obturator foramen, pubic symphysis, and the lesser trochanter. For the hips themselves, uh, the modified cleaves is an AP oblique of the femoral necks. Uh, the patient is supine. If you are doing it bilaterally, uh, you want to make sure that there's no rotation of the pelvis. Once again, that ASIS equal distance uh, from the tabletop on both sides. We want to flex the hips and the knees, draw the feet up as much as possible, abduct the thighs equally and maximally, and then we want to place the soles of the feet together for support. Our central ray is going to be about one inch above the pubic symphysis. Uh, central ray perpendicular to MSP at a level one inch above the pubic symphysis. And we're going to use a collimated field of 14 by 17. Uh, you can see this is a male patient. They did end up shielding here. Uh, which is fine to block the, uh, the rami and the symphysis because you're looking at the hip area. Most of the time, uh, we don't do bilateral. We generally do the modified cleaves uh, unilateral. Uh, we're going to make sure that we center the ASIS of the affected side to the midline of the grid, uh, flex the uh, affected hip and knee, going to draw the foot up to the opposite knee as much as possible and you're going to abduct the thigh about 45 degrees laterally. Central ray is perpendicular to the femoral neck. I want you to make sure that when you're doing the modified cleaves that you do not rotate the pelvis. So you want uh, the pelvis not rotated. You want to drop the leg out to the side. Notice the femur is not going to be in contact with the table. Take a look at the radiograph that's produced. You're going perpendicular to the femoral uh, neck area. Uh, when you take a look at this, you can see that this radiograph, the patient has a pin. We want to make sure that we don't clip any of the pin uh, on our radiograph. For the AP hip, patient is supine, no rotation of the pelvis again. Once again, your ASIS to tabletop distance is equal on both sides. Medially rotate the lower limb and the foot about 15 to 20 degrees. Uh, this again will place the femoral necks parallel to the IR. Central ray is perpendicular to the femoral neck. Uh, use the localization technique uh, previously described. Uh, what they mean by that is that look in your book. There is a, a section in Merrill's that will tell you how to localize uh, for the hip. Uh, so you want to make sure that you, you look at that um, in the textbook. Generally, you're going to uh, go about at the uh, level of the top of the trochanter. Or you can go uh, from a line from the symphysis to the ASIS, bisect that line and drop it down. Uh, two and a half inches should bring you to about the neck area. Uh, if there is a pin, we want to make sure, once again, that uh, we want to get the whole pin, so we may have to adjust that centering a little bit. Uh, look at the field size. You don't need a big field size. It's about 10 by 12 inches. The Lowenstein method for the lateral of the hip uh, in some places is used. The big difference here is that the pelvis is going to be rotated a little bit, and the femur is going to be in contact with the table. Uh, notice when it says this method is contraindicated if a fracture or pathology is suspected, just like the cleaves or modified cleaves would be as well. Patient position, you're going to rotate slightly toward the affected side on, uh, to an oblique position. So the pelvis is going to be oblique. That femur is going to be in contact with the tabletop. 
Heart position, center the affected hip to the midline of the grid. Flex affected knee, draw the thigh to almost a right angle to the hip. Body of the femur, notice, is parallel to the table, so it's in contact with the table, and you're going to support the opposite hip and the knee. Take a look at the uh, picture there of the patient uh, turning uh, to the side. Central ray, for the Lowenstein method, it's perpendicular through the hip. Okay, enters midway between ASIS and the pubic symphysis. And your collimated field is a 10 by 12. If you take a look at the radiograph, you can see the acetabulum, the femoral head, the femoral neck area, and the lesser trochanter and ischial tuberosity. The Hickey method is very similar to the Lowenstein method. In fact, the patient positioning is the same. The only thing that's different is there is going to be an angulation, and that angulation is going to be 20 degrees cephalid. So notice your first bullet point. Patient and part position are the same for the Lowenstein method. Central ray is angled 20 degrees cephalic, enters the hip joint again, uh, center the IR to the CR, collimated field again, uh, 10 by 12 inches. Generally for this radiograph, uh, AP, we're going to take the 10 by 12, we're going to put it lengthwise, but for the lateral hip, the Lowenstein and Hickey methods and the modified cleaves, we can put the cassette uh, crosswise because notice the femur then is coming out um, away from the body. In cases of trauma or in cases of recent surgery where the patient's hip cannot be uh, bent and dropped out to the side and you still need to get a lateral, the type of lateral that you do is called the Danielis Miller method. It's an axial lateral of the hip. Take a look at the patient. In the picture, the patient is supine. Uh, elevate the pelvis for thin patients. If they're very thin, you need to get that hip to the middle of the uh, IR. We're going to flex the knee and the hip of the unaffected limb to place the thigh as vertical as possible. I can tell you from clinical experience, the more that you get that femur uh, uh, the, of the opposite side to a vertical position, the better uh, image you're going to get. Rest the unaffected leg and foot on some type of a support. Uh, some techs are very creative with that, uh, but you need to get that leg up and out of the way. Uh, another way that I've seen it done is to take a sheet, wrap it around the unaffected knee, and then have the patient pull back to hold the uh, femur out of the way. You don't want any rotation of the pelvis. Uh, rotate the affected limb about 15 to 20 degrees medially, and that's if possible. If the patient cannot uh, invert the foot due to pain because of trauma, uh, just make sure that you document that on the requisition. So take a look at the picture here of the uh, person at the top. Notice what you're doing. You're going right through the groin area, shooting right through the hip, and then you're going to get the radiograph that looks uh, like that at the bottom of this slide here. So your IR is vertical with the upper border in the crease above the iliac crest. So you take your 10 by 12, and of course this is going to be a grid cassette. You're going to put that at the top of the uh, hip bone at the crest. And then what you're going to do is you're going to leave that part of the cassette in contact with the body, and you're going to swing then the uh, other side of the cassette away from the body until it's parallel with the femoral neck. Uh, support the IR in position, and then your central ray uh, is going to be horizontal and perpendicular to the long axis of the femoral neck. We have to make sure that we are coming in at the same angle as our IR, uh, otherwise we're going to get great cutoff. And it's a collimated 10 by 12 inch field. Uh, Generally, put the cassette lengthwise, running the length of the person's body. Take a look at the radiograph that you get. You got the acetabulum there. You've got the femoral head, the femoral neck area. Look at the greater trochanter, a little bit on each side. 
and then the ischial tuberosity is at the bottom of the radiograph. That's going to be important because you're going to want to make sure that when you send it through in packs that you're sending the image over correctly. So look at that ischial tuberosity. It has to always be on the bottom. There are some special views for the acetabulum itself. These are called Jade views. Uh, notice the two radiographs. You're radiographing the same side or same hip area and then you're just doing both obliques of that side. The internal oblique is used to demonstrate the posterior rim of the acetabulum and the iliopubic column, that column of bone between the ilium and the pubic area. And then for the external, uh, this is going to demonstrate the anterior rim of the acetabulum and ilioischial column. So internal acetabulum iliopubic, external acetabulum ilioischial. How do you do this? Patient position, internal oblique. We're going to do 45 degree oblique, posterior oblique with the affected side up. So take a look at your bearings for this drawing here. You're, you're looking down on the patient's pelvis here. Uh, notice the acetabulum. You've uh, put the body into an LPO position, so the right side is up. Central ray is going to be perpendicular, entering two inches inferior to the ASIS of the affected side. So palpate the ASIS, go two inches inferior. You're going to go right through that acetabulum, and we're going to use a 10 by 12 inch uh, cassette. So on this one, patient is turned, acetabulum of interest is up. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do the opposite oblique of that acetabulum. So 45 degree posterior oblique with now the affected side down. So we're doing both obliques of the same acetabular area. Central ray is perpendicular and at this point you're entering the symphysis pubis. Look at the drawing and you palpate the symphysis. You're going to go right through that area and that's going to take you then right through then the acetabular area. Collimated field is 10 by 12. As far as image evaluation, images, what makes a good pelvis? So good collimation, entire pelvis along with the proximal femora. So you can't clip the iliac crest. You can't clip the hip area. Um, both ilia and greater trochanters equidistant to the edge of the radiograph. This is to put you right in the middle. Lower vertebral column is centered in the middle of the radiograph. And one of the biggest things you have to do when you, you do a pelvis is you got to make sure that it's not rotated. This radiograph, there is a little bit of rotation. I can see that one iliac wing is a little bit smaller than the other one. Um, and look at the obturator foramina. They're not exactly symmetric. So if we take a look at the points that are here, both ilia symmetric in shape. And you can see on this one, there's a little bit of rotation. Uh, symmetric obturator foramina, we can look, one doesn't look exactly like the other, so a little bit of rotation. The ischial spines, look closely. I want you to look at the head of the femur, and then I want you to look at the acetabulum, and then notice there are two little small triangular pieces of bone coming out. Those are the ischial spines. If they are seen, because depending on the construction of the pelvis, sometimes they're not seen in the AP presentation. But if you see them, you need to see both. If you're only seeing one, that means a patient's pelvis is rotated. So basically, you want to see both or none. Okay, you don't only want to see one of them, because if you only see one, then the patient's pelvis is rotated. Uh, and the sacrum toxic area, if you drew a line straight down, the tip of the coccyx should be in alignment with the pubic synthesis. Femoral necks are in their full extent without superimposition. Why? Because you've inverted the feet. Greater trochanters are in profile. When you invert the patient's feet, notice the lesser trochanters. They kind of get rolled behind the bone and you don't really see them very well. So you don't want to see uh, any, or if you do, just a little bit of the lesser trochanters. And of course, we need to see soft tissue and bony trabecular detail. 
For the modified cleaves, pro evidence of proper collimation, no rotation of pelvis is demonstrated by the symmetric appearance. Acetabulum, femoral head and femoral neck should be seen, and the lesser trochanter on the medial side of the femur. Modified cleaves femoral neck without superimposition by the greater trochanter. Excess abduction would cause the greater trochanter to obstruct the neck. Femoral axes are extended from the hip bones at equal angles, and you should see soft tissue and bony trabecular detail. So here on the unilateral, uh, a nice modified cleaves. Remember, the modified cleaves is sometimes referred to uh, by text as the frog lateral or the frog leg lateral. Uh, depending on the site that you're at. Uh, if the patient does have a pin, you want to make sure that you don't clip any of the pin. We need to see all of the pin. A uh, little trick, uh, if you very modestly raise the gown on the side of the, the that you're going to be radiographing and you look at the scar to where they had surgery, usually if you put that collimated light field to the bottom of that scar level, uh, you're usually going to get the entire pin. So just a little uh, clinical hint there for you. For the AP hip, good collimation needs to be seen. Regions of the ilium and pubic bones adjoining the pubic symphysis. So notice that is what you need to have on your image. Pubic symphysis all the way out to the trochanter area. Hip joint should be in the center of your image. Proximal one third of the femur should be seen. The femoral head is penetrated and it's seen through the acetabulum. So look at the femoral head on this radiograph. Look at the acetabulum. You can still see the head through the acetabulum. Entire long axis of femoral neck is not foreshortened. Why? Because you inverted the foot. Greater trochanter in profile, lesser trochanter not usually projected beyond the medial border of the femur or only a very small amount of it should be visible. As I mentioned, any pin or orthopedic appliance in its entirety and soft tissue and bony trabecular detail. For the Lowenstein method, proper collimation, hip joint center to radiograph, hip joint, acetabulum, and femoral neck. Femoral neck is overlapped by the greater trochanter in the Lowenstein method, and soft tissue and bony trabecular detail should be seen. For the Hickey method, okay, now remember for this one, we're going to put an angle. So we're going to try and get that, uh, that trochanter kind of separated now. So evidence of proper collimation, hip joint center to the radiograph, hip joint acetabulum and femoral head should be seen. With the cephalid angulation and the Hickey method, the femoral neck is free of superimposition. So take a look at the radiograph now. You've angled so that neck area, you're freeing it up from superimposition by the trochanter. And soft tissue and bony trabecular detail should be seen. For the Danielis Miller or the shoot through lateral hip, as it's more commonly known, shoot through lateral hip, evidence of proper collimation, hip joint with acetabulum should be seen, femoral neck without overlap from the trochanter, greater trochanter. A small amount of the lesser trochanter on the posterior surface of the femur. Small amount of greater trochanter on the anterior and posterior surfaces of the proximal femur when the femur is properly inverted. One of the biggest things we want to do uh, is look at that radiograph for uh, the amount of exposure or density. Uh, we want to make sure that we have, that we have penetrated enough uh, so that we see that acetabulum and that head fitting right into the acetabulum. Ischial tuberosity below the femoral neck, head and neck. Soft tissue shadow of the unaffected thigh is not overlapping the hip joint or proximal femur. Remember, we're going to get that opposite leg, the non-affected, up out of the way, hopefully to a vertical position. And any orthopedic appliance should be seen in its entirety. Soft tissue and bony trabecular detail should be seen. 